All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to another Mass Medic webinar. Today we are here with our friends from Alira Health and we're going to be talking about their latest CDMO report. Before I turn it over to them, I do just want to introduce myself. I'm Nicole Owens, the Director of Marketing Communications for the organization. If you're not familiar with MassMedic, we are a trade association um, that works to bolster the medical device industry through education and connection, event like, events like this, advocacy and awareness. Um, a few housekeeping notes, we are recording the webinar today, so everyone who registered will get a copy of that. And we definitely encourage you to scan the QR code on the screen here and download the CDMO report so you can read all the great content. You'll also get a link to that in the follow-up email. We um, are gonna have time for Q&A, so please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen anytime they occur, and we will do our best to answer them in the time that allows. All right, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Carlo. He is a partner in the Transactional Advisory Group at Alira, and he's gonna kick off today's webinar. Thanks. Um, thank you, Nicole, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we appreciate the opportunity that Masmatic gives us to uh, present yearly our research and insights on the global medical device CDMO landscape. Uh, this tradition started five years ago uh, during COVID uh, when Masmatic first asked us to provide a, a report on a, a very important theme for the Masmatic community, which was contract manufacturing and supply chain management in medtech. And it feels really incredible that five years later, we're here with our series of of articles and publication and insights. And um, thank you, Masmatic, for keeping us honest uh, and continuing to raise the bar of, you know, of, of our efforts. Uh, we always try to um, make our article insightful and, um, you know, provide new angles and new perspectives. Um, this year, a report which you can download from um, uh, from our website. Uh, my colleague may may share here in the in the in the chat section uh, the, the link if you haven't been provided one already uh, i was saying this year we decided to continue our coverage of global medical device outsourcing trends but to focus specifically on an analysis of the european landscape uh, meaning that as we've done uh, for a few years uh, with a focus on the u.s market we decided to deep dive uh, into the fabric of um, contract manufacturing in multiple European territories. And the goal of that is really providing a more uh, comprehensive global coverage of trends. Um, we give a sneak peek of our report uh, less than a month ago at MBNM West when we had a very insightful expert panel. And one of the key trends that was uh, validated by these experts is the medical device industry is uh, shifting towards uh, a regionalization of supply chain. This means that the Americas, Europe, Asia, Pacific, and the rest of the world will have their own clusters, their, their stronghold of operations, vendors, suppliers, and logistical systems to support time to market and uh, bring devices to market. I think um, what the world went through since COVID and during a, a period of disruption in, in global supply chains really taught a lesson and the, the system is responding and there are long long term plans to establish um, and strengthen these regional presence. Of course, this has a tremendous influence on you know the footprint of, of the industry from a manufacturing standpoint, but creates tremendous opportunity for uh, medical device uh, outsourcing organizations. Um, to structure themselves with a global offering of services um, and the challenges that, that come with it, right? Um, a, an industry that historically has been polarized based on smaller shops, uh, you know, reflective of the talent of engineers and practitioners for the local markets is now really becoming a professional global 
process oriented industry to make um, to meet the demands of of OEMs, but even more importantly than that, uh, to converge with uh, you know um, the, the the broader uh, trends in healthcare, which are driven by patient outcomes and you know f um, deliver better procedures uh, more efficiently uh, and you know in line with the with with the regulatory and and, and policy um, trends of, of our industry globally. So. With, within this ba background, we um, you know we we develop our insights um, based on um, our practice, uh, you know, professional practice and expertise working with customers. Alira Health, if you will allow me uh, a brief infomercial, is a is a global advisory platform uh, dedicated to the life sciences. Um, we have a clinical and regulatory affairs group, a strategy market access group, and our transaction division that Sophia and I represent here today. Uh, we do not only do cover, you know, the, the the CDMO market. We are technology and and um, and clinical experts. Um, these insights uh, has helped us, you know, to um, understand and 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 navigate. Um, the trends from you know from market applications that have uh, trickled down or, or rather upstream in in the value chain. In the CDMO space, uh, we interact with uh, entrepreneurs and investors in in two capacities. On one end, we are transaction advisors, so we support the sell side, typically entrepreneur led or or private equity backed organizations in uh, in, in mergers and acquisition. Our strategy group is uh, really expert at supporting financial sponsors and, and, and corporations uh, in assessing uh, the commercial value of their M&A targets. We collectively, we have uh, participated in over 100 um, transactions uh, in, in, in less than a decade, so playing a big part in, in the consolidation trends that uh, we're going to comment on today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to um give the floor to my colleague Sophia and uh, who will walk you through the core of the of the presentation I will be back uh, in in about 20 minutes to to provide some insights on on the MA trends and then and then to host some some Q a uh, before doing that I would I would like to thank Sophia and and our other colleague Eve Ogden who have authored this report with me and Thank you for your passion and quality to put into this. I'm, I'm sure it will show uh, from your words here today for the audience. Sophia. Thanks, Carlo. Thanks for the warm introduction. And hi, everyone. Also, thanks, Eve, for the support in this report, as Carlo mentioned. In this 20 minutes, I will start with an overview of the medtech market performance. Then I will discuss what are the global uh, trends in the CDMO landscape then deep dive into Europe and present a couple of countries as an example of uh, the analysis that we conducted. And then I will give the floor back to Carlo to discuss the m and trends. So starting from, let me see if the presentation moves forward. Yeah, starting from the MedTech um, landscape. So MedTech in 20, from 2022 to 2023 grew less than 5%. And in vitro diagnostic was one of the main detractor, surely impacted by the decrease of COVID-19 testing. However, we've seen uh, growth, significant growth in the orthopedic business with new innovative implants and materials. Uh, we've seen a strong growth in cardiovascular driven by the increasing prevalence of disease as well as the awareness around them. And in surgery, we've seen a sharp um, growth um, driven by um, minimal invasive procedures among, um, among other practices. A couple of words also about the uh, meta capital market activity in 2023. So we, we observed a decline in terms of ter um, deals uh, volume. Uh, we didn't observe any initial public on um, offering and this underscores the, the, the persistent challenges in, in the industry. Uh, 
the med tech industry did not increase only in volume, but somehow also in value. And we've seen a, an overall reduction in what we call the mega deals. Some companies um, undertook strategic uh, reorganization through carve-outs uh, or, or spin-off. And also, if we focus on earlier stage companies, we have seen um, more risk aversion from investors to uh, putting in a lot of money in new companies. And, and in general, venture finance uh, funding market, um, so negative valuation readjustments compared to, to previous years, significant amount of the insider-led uh, rounds to drive the capital raises. Um, so the 2023 market was capital market was not at its best in the med tech space. However, we do still see a um, uh, strong interest also in early stage technologies, in early stage companies, and this demonstrated um, by the uh, large number of VC funds that were funded um, in 2023, so ready to deploy money in, in the years to come. But Focusing on the market that interests us uh, today, so the outsourcing market. The outsourcing market experienced uh, um, a growth of more than 11% and reached 81.5 billion US dollars in 2023. Jointly, the European and the US markets represent 55% of it, with the US slightly outperforming Europe, both in size and growth. The two regions have high value services uh, to a long standing clientele. However, we need to point out some of the differences between two countries. So, uh, Europe is a conglomerate of, of countries that have different regulatory and market access characteristics, different labor markets, and cost structures. And as a result, the fabric of the medical outsourcing is more fragmented. And uh, as Carlo anticipated before, European original equipment manufacturers tend to work with local vendors. So we're seeing this shift towards uh, manufacturing domestically to stabilize also supply chain and mitigate risk um, of disruption, as well as being able to better serve uh, uh, the local um, and, and respond to the local requirements, uh, for example, from a regulatory perspective. Um, local sourcing drives shipping costs down, of course, and uh, enables stronger partnership between CDMOs and the OEMs that are present in the territory. The lower flag inflation also impacted this market, the market positively, and the market is expected to grow also in, in 2024. Um, the restraints, what impacted the market negatively in 2023? Of course, the, the lower funding to uh, new, um, uh, new innovation, new, new programs, somehow impacted also in the manufacturing of these devices and the design and development of, of these devices. Um, and the predictability of the demand is, is always difficult. Therefore, um, this may impact purchasing order and the inventory management of, um, of CDMOs. But um, so this year we had the this European focus to um, because we believe that European market represent major opportunities for American investors and industry players. US, US players will look um, to European firms as an opportunistic window to, um, into new customers. And we have seen the US based the CDMOs that have already expanded in Europe have some success capturing new demand. So we complemented our research by assessing um, our US research that was conducted before by assessing 330 plus players with a footprint in Europe. Footprint meaning companies headquartered locally or in foreign territories. They map their capabilities, location, um, and the end markets this they serve, and really try to build the uh, the market bottom up. Um, in this pie chart, as well as in the, in the table below, we divided the players identified in terms of, of science. And 
what we um, we can say is that uh, all of the large CDMOs this represent the um, uh, European met uh, metech CD, um, outsourcing revenue. So then the, the all the large companies and a third of the medium represented here are organizations that have a US headquarter. And showing even more in detail, so in the top graph, we have the split in terms of um, country of origins. And if the US players uh, represent only 16% of the total number of CDMOs that we identified in Europe, they represent nearly 50% of the total revenues of the um, CDMO European market. While if we sum up uh, in EU4, UK, Ireland, Nordics, and Switzerland, they represent nearly 75% of the players that we identified, but less than half uh, of, um, of the revenues in Europe. So compared to the US players, European players are small, but they are mighty. And let me give more color on our finding um, in the European countries that we assessed. So, so zooming in on Western Europe, we see how the footprint of CDMOs vary a lot depending on different economies, the traditional manufacturing competencies, and the presence of certain original equipment manufacturers in each region. In countries like Ireland, the UK, France, and Italy, we tend to see uh, small, highly specialized players that generally stay confined within domestic borders. On the other end, Germany, Switzerland, and the Nordics feature larger firms with a more international reach. So each region is highly recognized for some technical specialization. And if we were making a hashtag to call out their most prominent offering, we could say that the UK and Ireland boast uh, design and development capabilities. Germany and France have to offer strong component manufacturing. Switzerland has uh, advanced precision manufacturing, while the Nordics supply electronics components. Italy has a strong focus on injection molding in the medical device space. While we observe that in Spain, injection molding firms also cater to other industries like the, uh, the automotive. Um, countries can also be world renowned for some uh, end market they serve. One example is France, uh, that is world renowned for orthopedics, which is also one of the um, fastest growing medtech um, segments right now. Of course, not, not all of the CDMOs in a region behave the same. The nuances to that are um, represented. We try to represent them in, in our report. And we brought a couple of examples today. As a first example, I had we had to bring Italy. It's, it's well represented by our speakers here, but also because it's, uh, it has a great manufacturing history in, in the life science space. So the slide may look a little crowded, but if we focus on the top left, we see the, uh, the players that we identified. So out of the 59 players we identified in Europe, 75% uh, to 44 are headquartered there. And if we now um, focus on the pie chart uh, that shows the footprint of the Italy headquarter CDMOs, we see that out of these uh, 44 players, 86% of, of them, the vast majority, has only a footprint within the national borders, and only 14% of them have a global or a, a footprint outside, outside each. Um, so the, we know that Italian market is very peculiar as it's very fragmented. Um, the um, many 90% of the firms generate less than 10 million in, in revenue annually for, for this segment. And, and yeah, they serve national and most of them serve national and, and local clientele. They, uh, in some cases, are clustered in regional hubs. 
So OEMs can still leverage the synergies between different um, CDMOs in a region. One example is the Mirandola district, well known for tooling and injection mold, plastic injection molding. Injection mold, plastic injection molding is one of the um, most important uh, capability in Italy, uh, offered by 38% 30, uh, of the players. Of course, not all the Italian players are small, notably multinational global companies, JDS, Borla, Stefan Atterburg, are world recognized entities that provide high quality services worldwide. Then, uh, and on the other hand, I wanted to show Germany. And that's kind of an opposite country, opposite shows different company characteristics compared to, to Italy. We have uh, identified 80 uh, CDMOs, still 60% of them, 46 of them are headquartered in Germany. But if we now see the footprint of Germany headquartered CDMOs, we see that more than 60% of them have manufacturing locations outside their national borders. Um, German players are overall larger, with one third of gem them generating between 100 and 500 um, million of US dollars yearly within European medtech space. Um, and they offer often very integrated services. A um, large portion of them offer design and development capability as well as um, more than half of them, as well as packaging and assembly and packaging. So it really integrate large, larger integrated players. So what, we, what we've seen is that um, German CDMOs commonly cater to other industries beyond the med tech, like the automotive or the consumer, um, consumer goods. So Germany features a long and storied manufacturing history of established enough as established network of OEM also present in the country, including Scani, Vibrand, Siemens. Actually, um, first I mentioned I have manufacturing capabilities, in-house manufacturing capabilities too. So you can see just between these two European countries with an historical presence uh, and historical cap uh, capabilities in the um, outsourced uh, space, the outsourced medtech uh, um, space, the, the, their, their offering varies a lot. Their, their, the characteristic of each country varies a lot. And in our report, we try to show other key countries, how, they be, how other key countries uh, behave. We believe that monitoring this trend, monitoring these differences is important on one side for um, OEMs and customers to try to um, find the capabilities and suppliers in each region and from the CDMO's perspective to explore eventual um, M&A opportunities. And I will now leave um, the floor to Carlo that will explore more how m and performed in 23 and what we expect as uh, key trends for the next years. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sophia. And just as a note, the report, if you will download it, will uh, provide a coverage of, of other territories and you know deeper insights. Uh, so we, we, we appreciate your feedback and um, hope, hope that you will find it very interesting. So uh, shifting gears, uh, I will now in the next 10, 15 minutes uh, discuss the M&A landscape. Um, industry consolidation has been uh, one of the main elements of interest uh, really that put this industry on the stage uh, of, you know, global uh, private equity investors. And, and so monitoring M&A activity is, um, you know, is, is paramount. Uh, it's actually where our activity in the space generated at, at Alira Health. Um, this, uh, this slide provides a snapshot of deal making uh, in our space in, in 2023, which was very robust. Um, collectively, 2023 outperformed the prior year, 2022, in terms of number of deals. Um, against the expectations a little bit, I would say. 
um, Sophia commented on, you know, the macroeconomic weaknesses and, you know, cap capital market weakness uh, that, you know, uh, affected 2023. Uh, so definitely a decline in in activity was expected, you know, and a, um, and and a decline in in average valuation. That didn't happen. the The market um, was very robust. Um, it showed both uh, continued add-on activity by established private equity platforms, as well as the formation of new uh, investment platforms. It featured major exits. Uh, and uh, and mid to large cap deals um, more than you know in 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 the prior years. So um, this um, this overview showcases uh, really the health of the the capital industry invested in 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 medical device CDMO. Uh, now a few particular trends that we observe in in this backdrop. Um, Certainly, an increase in cross-border transactions. Um, the pie chart that, that we see here in, in the middle, uh, we don't have a, a reference with with prior years, but I can testify the uh, the ratio of out of U.S. transaction is certainly increasing, uh, meaning that. Um, marketplaces are targeting capabilities located in other regions, and now that global consolidation is not limited to the um to the US borders. Um the number of 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 uh, deals involving cross border acquirers but targeting US targets is also on the rise. This has been you know noticed over over a multitude of years and you know it this just reinforces the um the perspective of a truly global industry where um market players are you know deliberately trying to establish uh operations globally in multiple regions in proximity to their customers and to leverage that um, proximity of, of course to to the end market but also uh where the the OEMs are based and um i was mentioning uh, at the beginning of this presentation you know just a general trend that we've observed and we've been able to validate with the uh, uh, OEMs uh, of you know establishing a vertical integration of services near the customers uh, that is certainly confirmed by the the trends in M and A and what what emerges from the data. Um, the target capabilities of M and A transaction that we show here at the bottom left uh, of the, of the slide, maybe they don't give an, an idea of the discrete. Um, you know characteristics of of specific deals, but it definitely shows diversification, right? And a tendency to move upstream in the value chain um, in order, you know, to acquire and integrate design and development capabilities, component manufacturing, you know, and and really this is a a clear vertical integration play that is a uh, uh, influencing different kinds of of, uh, of players both large mid and small i think it's a playbook that is now uh, really notorious right and uh, the activity of private equity that you know serves as a to ignite you know the formation of more diversified platforms of services more cost competitive most more differentiated from a capability standpoint means that these um, um, attempt, this trend of creating vertical integrated one-stop shops is not limited to the, uh, you know, to to the larger company as we may have uh, appreciated just just a few years ago. Um, I think uh, target markets are obviously an angle uh, worth worth uh, worth mentioning. What we observe is that the higher value. Uh, procedures and and devices and capabilities, uh, you know, targeted to this type of more more sophisticated engineer devices, uh, attract the majority of deals and 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 certainly the the higher valuations. So orthopedics uh, have been a big driver, cardiovascular consistently over the past few years, um, and you know, minimally invasive sur uh, surgery, and and so forth. 
um, not surprisingly. Um, I mentioned valuations a couple of times. Uh, this is the first year that our articles will not provide a chapter or a focus on the analysis of um, average uh, m and transaction valuation. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is these deals tend to be increasingly private and there's a kind of a tendency not to share publicly the terms of deals. And so let's say the statistical pool to interpret this data is becoming smaller and, and not as robust as it used to be. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are deal makers. We participate in, in a dozen transactions a year, and we can certainly provide some qualitative perspective on what's happening in the market. Um, at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, as I mentioned earlier, there was a, a, a bit of concern about the sustainability of the macroeconomics um, and of the fundamentals of these industry. Uh, we came off for the COVID years with a little bit of uh, hyperdrive of, of M&A where uh, investors, you know, proved willing to pay pre strong premia to buy growth inorganically. Uh, at the beginning of last year, but already at the end of 2022, there was a bit of a shift in momentum and, and in perspective. The, uh, these concerns surfaced and investors became a little more disciplined and cautious, I think, in participating in auctions, bidding auctions, and looked at really specifics uh, to their business case before making investment decision. This means looking at the synergies at the post-merger integration, at the customer service, and kind of long-term strategic fit of their of their M and A targets. What these are turning to is certainly longer process M and A processes. It takes longer to sell a business and you know to find a match. Um, you know, bidding auctions are. Uh, less crowded, there is less competition, you know, there are few, fewer players really are willing to uh, pay premium, I guess. And and um, and I think I you know, attribute that to the discipline of, you know, really finding a more narrow path to creating um, value through M&A. Um, surprisingly, this has not had a major impact on M&A valuations. In fact, I would characterize um, M&A EBITDA multiples as pretty stable and consistent with the prior years, um, because despite you know auctions and processes being less competitive, there is still a very strong appetite for inorganic growth, and uh, and uh, the advent of global cross-border acquirers, maybe cross-industry acquirers, has contributed to sustain the interest of, you know, of um, of strategic and financial sponsors. And so I I think this shows, regardless of the volume of, of, uh, of deals, really, um, um, you know, a as, as an element that will sustain and, and, and a resilience of, of M&A valuation. So unfortunately, we will not find specific data and insights in, in our you know, yearly report on this, but um, we, we're always welcoming you know, interactions with, with our audience and, and we'll be very happy to provide more insights in, in, in our opinions. Um, these slides also feature some major deals, you know, that happen in the year, multi-billion dollar transactions. I think this exhibits a tendency, first of all, of now mid to large private equity backed platform that are finding an outlet in the, in the M&A market, generating uh, large exits and an appetite for larger private equity fund, funds to participate in secondary buyouts, which will be a huge source of liquidity and obviously uh, you know, where, where the market is leading, e even greater, faster industry consolidation. Uh, I believe I have a transition slide here, if Sophia, you might may move. Uh, you know, this is just a, a reference to our 
um, you know, a section of our report. It's a census of all private equity platforms that we are tracking. We have identified more more than sixty nine globally, and we try to do a good job of you know reviewing activity. Each of these uh, platform may be bound towards an exit uh, through M and A or IPO, and at the same time will be a you know an aggregator and a, on the buy side of and you know uh, and igniting continued industry consolidation. So this is one of the sections of our report that is most uh, uh, appreciated and generate a, a lot of interaction. So. Uh, I hope you will enjoy this year's uh, edition, which is even more complete and accurate than, than the priors. Um, I would leave you in the next you know, couple of minutes with, with some considerations on, on trends uh, without repeating myself uh, on, on the broader consolidation. It's been clear from you know, the, the chart here to the left that there would, since 2020, there has been an acceleration in the formation of new private equity backed platforms and that these has had a multiplier effect on M&A activity. Uh, since 2021, we've had a record number of, of, of deals. Now, uh, of course, this creates a very deep pipeline for continued M&A for the years to come. Uh, will it mean that 2024 will have more deals, more activity than the prior? It's, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, the, for sure, the demand will, will continue to be strong. I think that we'll, uh, we're starting to um, enter in an environment where uh, there is a mismatch between mid and large uh, buy side players and the requirements they will, they will need in their you know, M&A targets to really be able to execute efficiently and integrate and create value for their customers. So this gap is starting to surface, and it will certainly create some um, um, some hurdles in you know in the M and A activity. So uh, there are, despite the robust um, you know tailwinds, there will be still challenges. And I think that uh, the, the the disciplined approach of investors to M and A will continue, and uh, investors will become ever more sophisticated. So if you're an entrepreneur trying to sell your business. Uh, you know, uh, I think appreciating uh, the challenges and the complexity of the buy side of um, of, of M and A is going to be very critical, and uh, uh, and navigating these trends will become uh, ever more challenging. Um, but regardless, there will continue to be appetite for for M and A, um, and you know, will will be. Uh, very happy to to monitor and continue tracking these trends. So uh, I think the outlook for the industry is very positive, and uh, you know we'll continue to attract capital investments and continue to um, you know fuel uh, a globalization trend, rather a regionalization on a global scale, which uh, in turn you know will provide ever more value-add services to the OEM, career opportunities for the practitioners, and, uh, and contribute to innovate an industry that is really the backbone of, of global medical devices. Uh, so we were privileged to have these, uh, you know, point of view of observer and, you know, market participants, and, and we'll certainly continue to report on these trends in the next few years. But in order to do that, what we're gonna need is the support of the of the community, and you know, will I, I of course um, invite everybody to reach out to us and provide your point of view. Uh, tell us what we did wrong, and you know, uh, what trends we should uh, and, and you would like you know to see emphasized in, in you know in the future, and and continue sharing your your expertise, which is very important and, and critical to to our reporting activities. So uh, with that, you know, I will. Uh, wrap up our live presentation, but uh, here are our contact information in case you want to reach out to us. But we have um, quite a few minutes available now, so I will pause for a second, and I, I would really love to give the opportunity to the audience uh, to ask some questions and, and, and keep it interactive.
I'm going Anna to give a Ja, yes. pauses. Go ahead, Sophia. Now, in the Q&A section, the, the, the question have been posted. Would you like me to read them or you, you can No, I, 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 I got it. Thank you. I got Perfect. this. So somebody is asking to share the presentation. The presentation is an is an excerpt of, of our report, which you can download from the link that was posted in the chat section uh, a few minutes ago. So you will have a even broader, bigger insight you know, in, in, into these trends. Um, first question, why do MedTech OEMs prefer using local CDMOs? So uh, there, you know, why OEMs do leverage local vendors? There's you know, multiple reasons. It, it really depends on what services and, and, and how critical the, you know they're seeking and how critical they are um, to their uh, to their business uh, proximity to um, engineering partners for example is very important to keep an efficient workflow and uh, ensure uh, you know time to market of the innovation program so having engineering talent uh, at reach is is ever more important um, Having a vendor that is really, you know, integrated with your supply chain and your, man, you know, manufacturing facility and your distribution centers is critical uh, to, you know, minimize logistic and, and inventory costs and um, and serve uh, your customers and, you know, hospitals with, uh, with you know, minimal time to market. So, uh, overall, it's a risk and, and, and resources management issues. Um, I think we came off, uh, you know, the early 2000s where there was a big trend of offshoring production and, you know, outsourcing to um, to China and other, you know, offshore regions that it has certainly, is, you know, come back, you know, particularly for higher complexities and value services that where proximity to the customers and the market are becoming more important. Um, okay, uh, I have a few questions now coming up. Um, one asks, what uh, are the expectations regarding strategics or private equity participation and contribution to uh, M&A in 2024? Um, it's a great question. It's hard to predict. Um, in the last couple of years, um, private equities have slightly outpaced strategic in, in terms of number of, of deals. And these uh, shows, uh, you know, kind of validate the number of new private equity backed platforms and how those uh, businesses uh, continue to pursue inorganic M&A. Uh, so that's a major engine of um, of you know deal making. However, strategics are being really active as well and um, very competitive. I think the participation of strategic players and corporate players was critical to sustain and push up valuations because they're less sensitive to uh, you know profitability and and uh, let's say. Uh, revenue accretion than uh, financial sponsors have. Uh, and so they can afford to look more at the long-term uh, intangibles of the businesses they acquire. So there will be equal uh, stakeholders in the continued trend of, of industry consolidation. And I wouldn't be surprised if we started seeing some major private equity exits in the direction of, of large strategic players or for some... Um, uh, you know, private equity backed platform that have now reached a certain global scale to pursue the IPO market in 2024 and beyond. Um, there's a very interesting question uh, about speed to value. I will try to paraphrase this, you know, and uh, I, I imagine that what we mean by speed and value, we mean growth, you know, growth trajectory of a certain business and the and the relative valuation in the M&A market. There's a very direct correlation. Uh, in fact, I would argue that without getting too technical, uh, 
when we, you know, the, the trend of pricing a business based on a multiple of their EBITDA performance, it really translates into two uh, parameters. One is the growth trajectory of the business, and the other is the intrinsic profitability of, uh, you know, the, 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 the type of service they provide. The greater the profitability typically means more complexity, more value had value add application. But the growth is a major element of this equation, uh, of this paradigm, because, you know, high growth means good clientele, robust, you know, and when you, your clients grow and you grow as a vendor, grow with them, it means that you are able to retain their trust, lock them into long-term relationships, and, uh, and wow. you typically defend um, wow. your, your market share in a more a sustainable way so absolutely growth is a is a major component of uh, of m and valuation if you can prove that your business is growing at market or faster than market it means that you're doing a great job and you will be worth more than your competitors i would like to take a pause and 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 push this this question to sophia sophia in a nutshell this is uh one of our of, of audience, what is, in your opinion, the main difference between European and U.S. CDMOs? <laughs> it's a tough question. Um, I would say that again, Europe differs a lot in in different countries. So I wouldn't. It would be hard to give the same answer if we're speaking as countries presented before, um, speaking on about Italy or about Germany. Uh, what we're seeing is overall um, a concentration of um, capabilities and real expertise that has been developed uh, in, in the country. So another example can be Switzerland, where we can see um, real precision manufacturing companies that do not serve only the, uh, the medical space, but other industry like the watches, for example. So the, what we're seeing is that the US is more like a market as a whole, while Europe features um, unique capabilities based on the, the history of the country that may be Developed uh, med tech uh, manufacturing after they had already expertise in other industries, then they expanded their their expertise in a manufacturing manufacturing something in a manufacturing with a manufacturing technique to the med tech uh, segment. So that's that would be my answer. I think the the, the difference is how the market is there diversified in Europe and still. Um, and key capabilities can be quickly identified across uh, um, across different countries. I don't know, Carl, if you want to add something on that point, and if you agree no, with you, me. you did great, yeah. and you, you you allowed me to rest my voice for for a couple of minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> I have another very interesting question. An anonymous asks, um, uh, "What is our view and our research uh, say about?" Uh, OEM's uh, expectation uh, with respect to the choice of CDMO partners. Um, uh, as opposed to, you know, pro formulating my own uh, my own thoughts, I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of relay an insight of uh, the panel that we hosted at MDNM West a month ago, specifically on this trend. And um, I would say, uh, again, to, to re emphasize, um, a trend that you know, was mentioned today a couple of times, regional presence is key. You know, being able to provide services in proximity of the end market is becoming more and more important. But there are other, other you know, factors that have been, uh, you know, self-evident for several years. One is innovation capabilities and uh, innovation in terms of, you know, ability to deliver innovation to market quickly and efficiently. So, you know, robust engineering capabilities and talent, but also process innovation, you know, and to ensure scalability and quality at affordable cost. Um, ultimately, it comes down to the specific technology capabilities that the outsourcing partner can contribute with respect to the customer side, uh, you know, e 
core capabilities. Um, at the panel, we had um, a senior in um, supply chain and um, v vice president from uh, from Edwards Life Sciences. He commented about you know wanting to outsource to the right uh, out, you know, to the right vendors technologies that they don't possess. So they're looking for really technical expertise and efficiency and, and, and ability to handle complex projects. One of the other insights that came out from that, that discussion was also the rate of innovation. And the, they positioned this issue in a very new way to me, at least. You know, when we talk about industry consolidation, we tend to, you know, just in, visualize a, a, you know, an increase in the scale of, of these operations, right? And maybe more diversified capabilities and more uh, capillary presence you know, globally and over multiple facilities. But the key glue that you know, keeps everything together is really people and uh, the ability of CDMOs and vendors and you know, engineering teams and, and operations teams to solve problems for their customers. And sometimes at the, the greater the scale, the greatest, you know, the more sophisticated the processes, the, you know, that ability to of problem solving and showing up at your at, you know at your client's facility and and you know solving a problem for them and uh, you know reducing the cost or finding a technical solution is reduced. So one of the words of cautions that uh, these um um practitioners from the OEMs, OEM side uh, preach were, were, you know, let's keep it a people business. So ability to innovate, problem solving capabilities over everything else. Uh, and, and then of course, you know, we have the cost sustainability um, and, you know, having a global well-integrated supply chain is a, is a critical component of that um, among other among other factors, you know, and, and and I would add this is, you know, from an, another thing that I already mentioned today is, is vertical integration. One-stop shops are really the thing, you know, and, and, and sometimes the ability to navigate the client's program from in, in design development into prototyping, into scale manufacturing seamlessly, uh, reducing, you know, the trick technology transfer cost and um, maintaining quality is really paramount. And and we see that a lot of smaller players are really competitive and able to deliver that to their customer, which which uh, which is fantastic to see. You know, in a highly competitive market. I think we have time maybe for another couple of questions. So I, I have a couple of questions here on China and Asia. Unfortunately. Uh, we are not focusing our research right now on the Asian markets. Um, it's, um, of course, an area of expansion of our research that we would really like to uh, incorporate in future editions. Um, we have been a little passive, uh, you know, towards uh, China and offshore uh, manufacturing locations for a couple of reasons. Since we started producing these uh, these reports and this research, there has been a clear insourcing or near sourcing trend. So we tried to shed light on that, but there's no doubt that China and Asia Pacific continue to remain, um, you know, a very um, important component of global supply chain, particularly with regards to uh, high volume. Um, you know, devices and components and material sourcing. So that's a, that's a huge portion of the market accounting to approximately 45% of the global industry. So uh, we, we will certainly uh, strive to cover that um, uh, more precisely and, and in, in, in the coming years. Uh, uh, I have a question about... Um, CDMOs, you know, that focus on the on design and development business, so conjuring design operations. Uh, we we certainly work with a lot of those and and appreciate that there are uh, a lot of you know small and mid-sized engineering shops around the country 
uh, with very sophisticated capabilities, great teams, great talent. Uh, we do monitor that uh, they're being targeted by more established CDMOs um, to join forces and contribute those engineering and innovation capabilities to the whole value chain via m a a lot of those companies still remain independent and will serve and you know the how to scale design and development services is is definitely a uh you know a big you know an outstanding question and a major theme of interest from m a players so um definitely a trend that we've seen in the last few years and will continue in the future um Let's see. I'm, I'm I'm skimming through the questions. I think we may have uh, uh, another one or two. Uh, it's time for another couple. Uh, okay. So, uh, this is a, a question specific to the M and A environment, and it asks uh, how acquirers, buyers, and investors uh, approach. Uh, customer concentration risk when you know uh, when they uh, when they buy um, you know execute on an MA opportunity. Uh, customer concentration is definitely uh, you know um, uh, can can be viewed as a risk as a, 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 an opportunity. A big driver of why um, investors pursue inorganic growth via MA is to accelerate their, you know, their business growth trajectory and acquiring new customer relationships. So there's no doubt that acquiring a company that has great customers is a major value and driver for MA. Now when that MA target has a lot of their business concentrated among a few um, OEM customers, that's a risk and, and that's typically reflected into a lower valuation, relatively speaking, right? However, it really depends uh, how the relationship with the customer is structured, right? Uh, con Long-term contracts are not really the norm in this industry, but there are major switching costs uh, to move from one vendor to another. And the more sophisticated and the more vertically integrated uh, the service uh, provided to that customer are, the greater the cost of moving away from that relationship is. So it is a complex, um, you know, question. It, it typically, uh, to answer that question, you know, in a transaction, there's a very, you know, there's the very deep thinking involving operational, regulatory, uh, financial considerations. And there's no one, a, a single answer. Every case, every customer, every program is different, but there's no doubt this is one of the major elements that show during the due diligence of an M&A deal when, when valuing a business. And, and we, we face these challenges on a daily basis in our job. Um, there are another couple of questions here that are kind of similar to what I've answered before, but I also want to be cognizant and respectful of everybody's time. We're approaching the top of the hour. And so on behalf of Sophia, myself, the whole team, uh, I would like to invite Nicole uh, from Masmatic back and to give you a farewell and greatly appreciate your participation today. And uh, thank you as always. Please reach out if you have any questions offline. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you both. What a great conversation. I mean, uh, Carlo's not kidding. We have probably 10 outstanding questions in there. So um, if your question did not get answered, please feel free to reach out to Carlo or Sophia. Their email addresses are on the screen here. They are a wealth of knowledge. Appreciate your guys' time today. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us um, watching this webinar. We appreciate your time as well. Um, I encourage you to go to massmedic.com and look at all the other great events we have coming up and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Have a great day.